I've been researching since I got into the ketogenic lifestyle how you become more healthy. And the exciting thing is, is I find getting healthy kind of boring. What I think is really exciting is getting optimally healthy. Like I didn't realize that there was such a thing, even as a practicing physician, 18 years I trained in emergency medicine. And the notion of like optimizing health, couldn't get it. But once I got started in improving my health, the more I did, the more healthy I got and the better I performed and the better my life. So that's why I have this passion to try to share that with other people. So. All right, so I'll, I'll confess to you, I like to tell people up front, part of my passion is I have Asperger's. So Asperger's kind of interesting thing we're learning about autism is probably associated with the diet my parents ate, and particularly when I was in utero. And one of the things that uh, causes me to do is I don't track so much how I'm coming off. So I'm a little bit intense. But what I'm really good at is measuring things. So even if you're away from me for like two weeks, I will see changes in your human body that other people can't detect. So it's a very interesting kind of capability that I have. It lends itself really well for me to learn but not so good in my delivery. So sometimes I come off a little bit intense. My wife warns me, you need to smile more and you need to laugh more. <laughs> Try to get people laughing. And I'm not so good with the humor, but my content is interesting. So try to look past my delivery. If I'm too intense, <laughs> just look at the content and I think you'll find some interesting value. So here's my own journey. I wasn't always a healthy guy. I became overweight and I was determined, I was previously in the army, and I was determined never to be an out of shape ex-army guy. But I had a break in the service where I got out of the army in 2005 and I became that, an overweight ex-army guy. And that was in the middle up there is uh, my, my wife, who I won't call her um, overweight, I'll just say she's a little plump. And then she, <laughs> she and I embarked on a ketogenic paleo lifestyle back in 2011, 2010, and she turned around considerably. And what was really interesting is after one year, I looked at my wife and all the cellulite that she had in her legs was completely gone. It was super exciting, the changes that took place in her. And this is me after about eight years in the ketogenic lifestyle. And what I want to share from this photograph is I went from that body to this particular body. This is one of my most recent photographs. And I have the number five up there to emphasize this point. For those of you who don't like to exercise, you'll be super interested to know that my lifestyle in those eight years was I averaged exercising only five minutes a day once every five days. Yeah. When you start eating healthy and you make healthy choices, it has a dramatic change on your body. Now, the way I exercise is a little bit unconventional. So in my research, as I started to look at this, I looked to nature and I recognize animals don't exercise for long periods of time. They basically have a fight either with another animal they're trying to kill or eat or with another animal that's trying to kill them or compete with them. So I exercise in a very intense manner for about five minutes, and it's pretty intense. I have a high level of intensity when I exercise. <laughs> but then it's done, and I don't have to exercise for a long period of time. So I try to mix it up because nature brings variety, and nature doesn't have programs. So now I sometimes exercise for a few days in a row, and sometimes not so much for a longer period of time. So Variety is what nature looks to, and nature through circumstances would bring that. So resist the temptation maybe of being in a, in a strong program. One of the things that got me out of my rut in medicine as a practicing emergency medicine physician was an increasing awareness of a particular pathology that really scared me. I was an emergency medicine trauma trained physician, trained in the army at our major trauma center, Brook Army Medical Center, San Antonio, Texas. I've seen all forms of trauma. 
I've seen all sorts, you know, I was the ER doctor who took care of somebody who was suffering a heart attack, suffering a stroke, some penetrating trauma, stabbings, motor vehicle accidents. Anything that was in the preventive realm, I didn't have any interest. I was like family practice. Dr. Noonan, that's boring. I didn't want to have anything to do with that. It was all about excitement. And yet, these patients would come in, and I began to see, you know, first when they'd come in with a, a sudden onset of a stroke, they'd look like this. Why? Because they couldn't move. They were paralyzed. Oftentimes, they can't talk. They may not even understand what I'm saying to them. Stroke is a devastating, acute onset of a, just a massively debilitating disease. The next time, oftentimes, I would see them would be six months down the road after they come back from that time in a nursing rehab center. Then they wouldn't even look at me. Their head was down on their pillow. The stretcher was bringing them in. They carry them, push, put them onto the bed. No eye contact. Why? Why the difference? Because in the six months since that stroke, they had resigned themselves to knowing that they would never change. <coughs> I'm not fear-mongering. Atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease that causes strokes and heart attacks is the number one killer still today in America. Each of you sitting in this chair have a chance to make a difference in your life. Those people would give anything and everything they ever got to have another life. So I'm here imploring you to pay attention to your body. It is the single most important, valuable asset that you own and will ever own. So we'll give you effective strategies to help minimize chronic disease. I hope that you pay attention to the providers that are here and the contents available to you. And it starts with a healthy diet. So I'm introducing this concept so that hopefully we can save some of you. And one day I hope to be able to change the discussion of doctors so that they can have those kind of conversations with their patients coming in where it starts with what are we going to do to prevent me, prevent you from having chronic disease and these kind of diseases that are so dramatically impairing our lifestyles. One of the things that I've noticed why this disease process happens is 30,000 years ago, your health dictated how long you were gonna live, whether you'd be able to survive. Today, that force is called selection pressure that existed 30,000 years ago that motivated you to be able to hunt and gather well and be able to run away from an animal that was about to kill you is completely gone. Everybody gets to live long. 77.9 months, I think, is the, the survival rate um, for people across our country today. Because selection pressure is removed, we just treat disease, we're gonna plug you up, give you medications mm -hmm. and things, but your quality of life is dramatically impaired. In the end, if you're looking at the quality of life as a measurement of how well we're doing the healthcare system, we're dramatically failing. So everybody gets, predominantly, everybody gets to survive. But it's this absence of selection pressure that has caused us to spiral into the condition that we're in. We're seeing chronic obesity and diabetes and all the other pathologies that you're aware of and that many of the other presenters have talked about. So one of the things that uh, really makes a difference is I think understanding that everybody has a different job today, but in the past everybody was a hunter-gatherer. That means the better you were at hunting and gathering, the longer you lived and the better your quality of life. Well, we've heard presenters talk about how our genes have not changed. They've been shaped based on our existence when we were all legitimately, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers. Our genes are still the same today. So to the extent that you are effective as a hunter-gatherer, you'll live longer and be healthier, and it applies today still. But most people vocationally thrive. They don't try to biologically thrive. I want to change your mindset from just trying to vocationally thrive, being the best attorney or the best uh, electrician or the best firefighter to being the best biological specimen you can be, and you're going to be better at everything you do. Your jobs, the fact that you may be a spouse, a sister, um, a brother, 
a volunteer, a coach, whatever it is, improves if you become biologically more healthy. So in the past, it was survival of the fittest. And what I noticed in my research and trying to figure out what can I do to help people get more healthy, I realized that it, in the past, it was not only survival of the fittest, but it meant survival of the resilient. The man or woman or child that was willing to work to hunt and gather a little bit longer when it's hotter and colder out there and more austere gave them the advantage. So survival of the resilient was what allowed you to survive, survival of the fittest, become more fit. But today it's different because we don't have that selection pressure. So who are the patients that I see really do well and biologically thrive? It's this, what I call the survival of the analyst. It's the man or woman, or the rare person, a young person, who can analyze things and look at the pluses and minuses, the advantages and disadvantages to how they eat and how they live their lifestyle and make that connection that they're going to start using, become more healthy, they have that advantage. And that's what we're finding out. Social media, media is helping to educate people when conventional healthcare is failing. They're not getting this information out there. So understand analyzing things. I'm so proud of my son up there in the back left corner because he recently made a decision to go high fat, low carb. And after being eight years living in my house with a crazy you know, ketogenic father, he's made a decision to go high fat, low carb. And now he's seen the advantages of doing that. But it's very hard for a young person to do that. There are not a lot of young people doing it. And I brought him here so you could see, hey, you're lucky because you're getting started early on. So be evangelist, try to encourage other people, and, uh, and share, the, share the wealth. So one of the things that happened, I noticed in my practice, and I'm going to get into how I do this, is I pay attention to things, how the body changes. And I get very interested. I told you I have Asperger's, and I track change a lot. Well, I use an MRI scan to track what's going on inside the body, but I also track what's going on outside the body. So one of the things happens, you have muscle wasting, atrophy, and all these kind of problems start developing. And to the extent that you choose and make healthier choices, you'll prevent a lot of these things from happening. And so um, you see you know, loss of muscle tone. Muscle tone is hugely impor important. So these are the, let me see if I can get this laser point. This is uh, what they call the, the lunch lady arms. Um, <laughs> But somebody who's been high fat, low carb, and keto for a long time is Mark Sisson. I think it was Dr. Noonan read his book, uh, The Primal Blueprint. And Mark um, is an inspirational figure. He's one of the first books that I read, uh, The Primal Blueprint, as well. And he, he obviously does not have much of an atrophied body. He's, I think he's 68 years old. So he's in great shape for a 68-year-old um, gentleman. So uh, you don't want to have muscle wasting. And one of the things you want to do is improve your blood flow. So I'm going to be talking about blood flow and how a ketogenic diet will increase your blood flow to those tissues so that they're well preserved. All right, so this is a, an aspect of my Asperger's. I forget what the heck I'm doing in time. <laughs> so <laughs> this is my convention to remind me to pay attention to time. So I've been talking for 17 minutes and only have... Uh, only have 40 minutes to talk, so I've got to pick it up if I'm going to get through this. <laughs> the other thing is, if you've got Asperger's, at least with me, I sit out in the audience when I'm listening to, to uh, people speak, and I'm like, dear God, how many more slices do you have? What, how many more slices do you have? So now you know exactly, I have 38 slides. <laughs> so if anybody's suffering Asperger's, you, you know where I'm at. All right, so this, this is a slide of some graphs that have uh, a representation of macronutrients. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but other to say that when you eat processed carbohydrates, not particularly simple carbs, it jacks up your, your, your blood sugars. Complex carbs like cauliflower and broccoli um, don't jack up your blood sugars as quickly. But the processed carbs do. The grains, the breads, the ice creams, things that taste sweet are things that go into your mouth and start tasting sweet, like bread and crackers those things will start turning quickly into sugars then in your bloodstream and cause insulin to go up. And as a result of the metabolism, it generates something called reactive oxygen species. And these things react to tissues in your body, cells. So they cause inflammation. So that's the harm that's because it's a common pathway of inflammation 
that leads to a lot of chronic disease. So you want to uh, shift away from simple carbs to more protein, which, look, which has a much lower um, impact on your blood sugar, and also eating healthy fats, not just any fat, but healthy fats, olive oil, avocado oil, uh, raw, organic, cold-pressed, or uh, coconut oil, and grass-fed butter, grass-fed ghee. These are more healthier sources of fat. Uh, healthy animal fat from ideally game meat. If you can't get game meat, then grass-fed bison. I'm a fan of grass-fed. If you can't afford grass-fed, then eat regular meat. But to the extent that you can economically afford grass-fed, I'm a believer in more game meat and grass-fed. Because if I'm going to eat a plant, or I'm going to eat an animal, and I want my body to be healthy, I want that animal to be the healthiest as possible. Because 30,000 years ago, when I was out, if I'd have been out hunting with my son up there, we wouldn't have got off the little old heifer that was limping around that was, you know, something we were going to eat. I'd have said, Sean, we're going to get that, that buck. Because he has the healthiest nu nutritional value in his meat and on his, on his pelt and his skin. And we would have gone for that. So you've got to be selective about what you eat. So I'm a believer in eating the healthiest possible. Uh, glucose is just like a water newspaper. You eat something with carbohydrates. It's a you know, water newspaper just creates a lot of fast energy quick, but it burns real dirty, real sooty, because of those reactive oxygen species that cause inflammation. So you want to avoid carbohydrates. Go for something more sustaining, ketones, thus the keto diet. So one of the problems that we have with conventional, I have with conventional medicine, is conventional physicians, of which I am one, an MD, we pay attention to things that are better aligned with making profits, selling drugs, and treating people, but not reversing disease. So we measure things like cholesterol, and we track your weight and body mass index, LDL and lab values. Personally, I think we should walk away from cholesterol. Who in this room Who has ever met a single human being, as long as we track cholesterol, and said, I got my cholesterol in order and it changed my life? <laughs> Doesn't happen. And the reason is because it's so filled with noise. So as a researcher, what you track is information and you divide it into two camps. Signal is what really works, what really matters, and the rest is distraction. The problem with cholesterol, it's filled with distraction and noise. It's something you can follow, but it's too, too much filled with distraction. So you want to follow something better. And that's what we did. Our research practice started about eight years ago in Plymouth. I practice in the suburbs of Minneapolis here. We got started uh, measuring biomarkers using an MRI scanner. We looked inside the body and started investigating the earliest expression of disease. It's been mentioned a couple times, visceral fat. We took that and we studied it. Over 4,000 patients we've scanned now, looked at their lifestyle, what works to get rid of visceral fat, what causes visceral fat. And we learned a great deal about it and some other biomarkers. We took our results to the National Science Foundation and we received a grant to fund, continue funding our research in reversing chronic disease. So what I've learned after 4,000 scans of patients, the people that get the best results are the people that are most motivated. So if you look at your scan and you see it, you get appropriate biomarkers, the engineers have an expression, if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get fixed. And so we help people to measure things that are wrong. I show them the enemy inside of their body and we help them make the necessary choices to get rid of it. So first biomarker that I'm going to cover quickly is visceral fat. We scan people through the level of their abdomen using an MRI. It doesn't use any radiation. MRIs typically, the average MRI in the United States is $2,200. If you're interested in doing an MRI scan, you can come to my research practice. We will do two MRIs for $150. It's like nothing. Yeah, how can we do it? We don't make money. My wife will tell you, we do not make money. <laughs> we're great researchers. We're horrible business guys. <laughs> but we're researchers trying to look at this. So if you're interested in measuring, quantifying, 
the amount of one of the first expressions of disease in your body, visceral fat. Everywhere you see white is fat. This, these are muscles in the back, your rectus spiny muscles. These muscles here are the psoas muscles. This is the vertebral body. This is your six pack in your anterior abdomen. This is your belly button. These are oblique muscles. We paint the visceral fat red here and the yellow is subcutaneous fat. Visceral fat is what causes chronic disease. We paint it red because it's the big enemy you want to get rid of. You do not want an ounce of this crap in your body. You want to shred it, get rid of it, quantify it, and get it the Hades out of your body. So this MRI scan allows that to happen. This, these are uh, some MRI scans of myself and one of my research partners who first got started. We both have 31 inch waists in the scans. This is when we first were getting started. And uh, he's a Chinese guy, Dr. CJ Zheng. He had all this visceral fat because he ate a lot of rice. And uh, so he was filled with visceral, visceral fat. But do you see this white streak in his oblique muscle here? Um, I have nice big oblique muscles because I was doing high intensity exercise. He didn't do any exercise. <laughs> um, he was a research, researcher. And his, so he's got this fat deposition. And what that is is marbling in a steak. So this is human marbling. That's what it looks like inside your body. And why does this steak look like this? Because it eats a lot of grain. Cows aren't supposed to eat grain. They're supposed to eat grass. So this is a steak. Unfortunately, it gets cut off. It is fed grass. So you see the difference? A lot less inflammation. So this is why I advocate, in part, uh, eating a, um, if you can, a grass-fed diet.